Since Kammkapellmeister Lind remained in the picture, however, and he confessed that whenever he saw monkey business, he felt a sense of triumph when he heard Groucho say it. Groucho's insecurity irritated Sid. Like many comedians, Groucho couldn't relax until he heard the audience laugh. He and the writers would work on a sequence for weeks until it seemed perfect. Then, a few days later, Groucho would say he was very worried about a scene and start tampering with it again. And Sid realized that he had probably run into someone, an agent perhaps, who in his own interest had made him doubt his writer's capabilities. After Groucho's death, Sid said that the only person capable of awing Groucho was George S. Kaufman. The playwright's glacial personality and formidable reputation intimidated the comedian. Even at the risk of displeasing Groucho, Sid was always trying to sneak recondite allusions into the script of Monkey Business, which Sheikman would then delete. Once Sid wanted to make a pun on the German Morgan, which means morning, and J.P. Morgan. I think we, true the, we draw the line at German puns, said Sheikman. Sid grew to dislike Sheikman, and when later he started to work on horse feathers, he wrote a friend that he hoped the gag man would not be too involved with the project. Sheikman did work on the picture, however, although his contribution was uncredited. The only thing the second script of Monkey Business had in common with the first was that it was about stowaways on an ocean liner. Everything else was changed. This new version was written mainly by Perlman and Sheikman. John Stone wrote the sight gags for Harpo, while Nat Perrin wrote the ones for Chico. With so many writers involved in the script of Monkey Business, it is impossible to know which writer wrote what line, although certain critics see Sid's hand at work in such lines as Lodge with my fleas in the hills, and You must have been married in rompers. Finally, after a few weeks of rehearsal on the soundstage, in which more gags and dialogue were added, Monkey Business reached the cameras in midsummer and was released in September of 1931. Depression audiences responded to its irreverence and unabashed spirit of insanity. It became one of the biggest hits of the season, breaking attendance records everywhere. The picture begins on an ocean liner, where the four brothers are stowaways in barrels. The stowaways of today were the stockholders of yesterday, observes Groucho. Discovered by the first mate when they start singing Sweet Adeline, the Marxes were, are routed from their barrels and then proceed to dash about the ship, manhandling the other passengers. The film follows their misadventures as each brother sings a verse of a Maurice Chevalier song in a vain attempt to convince New York customs officials that he is indeed the singer whose passport they have stolen. When a, custom, a customs official tells Groucho that his passport picture doesn't look like him, he snaps, It doesn't look like you either. They attend a racketeer's ball and finally wind up in a barn battling gangsters, while Groucho sits on the rafters, commenting on the action as if he were a radio sports announcer at a prize fight. In general, the critics were enthusiastic about the film, and many praised the writing. Mordunt Hall, in a review in the New York Times, commented, This monkey business is, if anything, wilder than animal crackers, and although it is more, perhaps not quite as expertly written, it is one constant round of merriment, utter nonsense, and wicked puns. This opinion was shared by Sid, who personally felt that Monkey Business wasn't as good a picture as Animal Crackers, but Harry Evans in Life, then a humor magazine, believed that it was not merely the writing that gave Monkey Business its lunatic sparkle. With all due credit to the commendable efforts of these funny fellows, Johnston and Perlman, we must add that we can thank Groucho for making the lines seem more original than they are. Many students of the Marx Brothers have noted that... have noted that certain sequences in Mark's monkey business bear a close resemblance to comic strips. This cartoon-like quality became part of the Marx Brothers' style, for as Louis Chavance pointed out in a few years after the picture was released, it is extremely s significant that the first scenario written for them with special intention for the screen was composed solely by caricaturists. Of the Marx Brothers, Sid once said, I did two films with them, which is in its way, which in its way is perhaps my greatest distinction in life, because anyone who ever worked on any picture for the Marx Brothers said he would rather be chained to a galley oar and lashed at ten-minute intervals than ever work for those, these sons of bitches again. But in October of 1931, he was not chained to an alley to a, a galley oar, 
but in New York, staying at the St. Moritz and waiting for the Marxists, Mankiewicz, and other members of the writing team, which this time consisted of John Stone and the songwriters Burt Kalmar and Harry Ruby, to come east so that they all could start working on the script for a new picture. Sid had just completed the dialogue for a Winnie Leitner picture at, at Warner Brothers, but the studio refused to give him, give him a six-month contract following his initial six weeks of work, preferring to have him work week to week. Sid hated Warner Brothers even more than he did Paramount. The regimentation was stifling. He had to be at his desk promptly at nine and could not leave until six. Phone calls were not permitted. Furthermore, the commissary closed immediately after breakfast, so that it was not even possible to vary the monotony by taking a coffee break. The prospect of working with the Marx Brothers again did not appeal to him either. Their exhibitionism thoroughly disgusted him. According to Edmund Wilson, Harpo told West and his sister to come into the dressing room, asking, Are you decent? When he didn't have a stitch on. They took physical advantage of people. Groucho terribly tiresome to talk to, gagging all the time, terrific vanity. Perlman finally had a showdown with him and said, That's not very funny, about one of his gags. Groucho said, Oh, so you don't think that's very funny? And gave him to damn well understand that he'd better think it was funny. When the Marx Brothers and their entourage finally arrived in New York, everyone sat around trying to think up an idea for a picture. After much soul-searching, they agreed that the movie should have something to do with college life, although no one could be specific about the plot. Then they all returned to Los Angeles, the Sid going by boat via Cuba and Panama. Its title, taken from a 1928 Barney Google cartoon, Horse Feathers, eventually emerged as a satire of college life, with the emphasis on athletics at the expense of education. Groucho plays for Professor Quincy Adams Wagstaff, the new college president of Huxley College, who, if he wants to keep his job, must produce a winning football team. The last game the college football team won was in 1888, and every year since then a college president had, has been fired. After taking office, Groucho immediately breaks into a song, Whatever It Is, I'm Against It, written by Calamar and Ruby, and leads the faculty in a soft shoe routine. He then instructs Harpo, the local dog catcher, and Chico, whom he recruits in a speakeasy to play football for Huxley. They are also to kidnap two rival team players until after the big game, but get kidnapped themselves, and the plot becomes increasingly convoluted. Since neither the Marxes nor Calmore nor Ruby had ever attended college, it is probable that Sid, who spent most of his college years writing diatribes against university policies, contributed much of the satire on academia in horse feathers. The very theme of the movie, Athletics at the Expense of Education, was reminiscent of the fiery editorials he composed for the Brown Jug, in which he had proclaimed, Millions for athletics and not a cent for aesthetics. He may have also been responsible for one of the film's most hilarious scenes, in which Groucho asks two professors, Where would this college be without football? Have we got a stadium? Yes, the professors agree. Have we got a college? Quizzes, quizzes Groucho. Yes, say the professors. Well, we can't support both, concludes Groucho. Tomorrow we start tearing down the college. The professors are aghast. But professor, where, where will the students sleep? Where they always sleep. In the classrooms, retort, retorts Groucho. Then Groucho's secretary rushes into his office to tell him that the dean of science is impatiently waiting to see him. The dean, she tells Groucho, is furious. He's waxing wroth. Oh, replies Groucho, is wroth out there too? Tell Roth to wax the dean for a while. These lines have always been attributed to Sid, who had used a similar play on words in a cartoon he did for College Humor. But whether he or another writer actually wrote the final film version does not matter. The spirit of Horse Feathers is pure S.J. Perlman, only a man who was forced to endure four years in a place where he didn't fit in and that refused to graduate him could have made such devastating fun of it. And for that contribution alone, Groucho should have been grateful. Well, that's it. The chapter was a little longer than I thought it would be, but uh, I guess that's the joy of YouTube, that I can go on and on and break it into four parts if I need to. But, uh, for anyone still listening, thank you. And uh, I look forward to my next reading broadcast. Maybe one of these days I'll even have some thoughts, my own thoughts on things. Cheers, everyone. Have a good afternoon.